Hey, this is Rush Schlecht, and I'm the senior pastor of Eastside Church, and this is our podcast. I want to thank you for joining us today. I hope this inspires you, hope it builds your faith, and I hope it gives you perspective on how God is moving in your life. Enjoy the message. Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. How are we doing? How's your summer? Good. Summer's going good. I get to go on a fly fishing trip with my oldest daughter this week. She's never been on a fly fishing trip with me before, so we're going to go float the Salmon River in Idaho for a couple days. Some rapids we get to go down, some class fours, and it'll be super fun. So we're really excited. I've done, I did the float last year, and I thought, man, I want to take each one of my kids before their senior year and get them on a float trip and introduce them to something that I love, you know. And so Julie gets to go this year, and Joey will get to go in a couple years. And they may like it, they, may not, they might not, but it'll be fun. We'll eat good food and hang out, so... I'm excited. Um, we're going to start a new series this morning, but let me just give you a recap of where we've been and then give you the why behind it. So we've had a lot of series in the past. We did one on the Holy Spirit recently. We did one on anxiety. We did uh, Courageous Conversations, which was awesome for our congregation. We did one on generosity. We walked through the book of Ezra and Nehemiah not too long ago. We walked through the Apostles' Creed together as a church. We walked through most of the book of Genesis we talked about habit forming one series. We walked through the book of Philippians, through Colossians. We walked through the life of Moses. And so if you look at this pattern, what we try to do here at Eastside is balance it between topics that are relevant to the congregation, kind of where we're at as a community, but then also supplementing that with just straight text, just going through books of the Bible together. And that's really because we want to give our congregation a steady diet of the Word of God, and the full counsel of God. So it's a mixture between topical sermon series and then exegetical sermon series. So sometimes we feel like it's just better to just go through a book verse by verse and just take what the book says to us. And then other times we feel like, well, let's take a particular topic and come at that from the Word of God. So you'll see that at different times. And right now what we're going to do is go back straight to the text, to the Word of God, and walk through uh, 1 John as a congregation. And I've never preached First John as a pastor before, never gone through it. I've never walked all the way through John's gospel uh, with a congregation before. That would probably take about six months or so, maybe longer, to walk through the entire gospel of John. This will take us a couple of months to get through First John as a family. And the reason I want to go through First John is his writings are very unique. He's got a unique perspective on the kingdom of God. Rather than uh, taking somebody like Peter or Paul, which we talk a lot about Paul here at Eastside, um, and the Gospels, the First John has got this, this very unique angle on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're going to go verse by verse for the next few months, and today is just going to be an introduction to the Gospel, of, not to the Gospel, to First John, and uh, we're just going to look at the first four verses. Now, if you don't know where First John is, go all the way to the end of your Bible, and work backwards. If you get to Revelation, just go back a few pages and you'll find 1 John there. So uh, we want to balance diet for our congregation, not just stay. Every pastor has their lane. Every uh, teaching team has their lane that they love to run in. And if you, if you aren't careful, you'll just stay in your lane. And what you want to do is be able to look at the entirety of Scripture and, and bring that into your community of faith and have the whole counsel of God be available to the people of God. So I like to jump around in the scriptures, like when I said Ezra, Nehemiah, Genesis, the life of Moses, then Philippians and Colossians. So try to take all of the scriptures and, and give us a better picture of who God is and how he uh, transforms our lives. So now 1 John, would you turn with me in your Bibles if you've got them to 1 John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4? We're going to read these together, and again, this is just going to be an introduction to some of the big themes of this text today, but I will tell you that uh, I think God wants to speak something to you through this text. I think he wants to change your life this morning. First John chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, and then we'll pray. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, and we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. I'm talking about Jesus, of course. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. 
and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, we write this to make our joy complete. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning, and we submit ourselves to the Word of God. We don't filter the Word of God through our life and see what comes out on the other side. We take our lives, and we filter them through the Word of God and see what comes out on the other side. That's what we want, Lord. So speak to us this morning through your Word as we submit to it. Amen. A lot of great themes in this text, but I want to hit one this morning that's important uh, that really jumps out. He writes at the end the reason for him writing this introduction, and he says this, I write this, or we write this, to make our joy complete. Now, he doesn't say my joy. John, the writer, isn't saying I'm writing this so that my joy will be complete. He's saying our joy would be complete. So who's the our in this? It's not so he can be happier. It's not so John the writer can be happier. And he's also not just saying the apostles as well. So those who have seen Jesus and have experienced him, which he writes about, we're writing this so that our joy would be complete. When he's talking about this group that have seen Jesus and that have experienced him and know his salvation, who's he talking about? He's talking about you. He's talking about Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. So when he's talking about All of these truths are coming at you, and I'm expressing them to you to make our joy complete. He's saying, this is what I believe he's saying, he's saying that all of our joy would be complete. It's all of us together. John's joy cannot grow unless his brother's and sister's joy is growing. What John is saying here is that he's not an individualist, that there's no such thing as individualistic Christianity Now, you may have run across this from time to time where people say, well, it's just my faith. I just do what I'm going to do with the Lord. I don't like to talk about my faith. I don't like to really get into it with other people. I don't want to hear about other people's faith. There's no such thing, according to John. It's our joy. It's our faith. It's our Christianity. We're all doing this together, and our joy grows together. I mean, you could take it so far as to say that if you're experiencing joy in the kingdom, then I'm experiencing joy with you. I'm experiencing joy vicariously on your behalf. Or if you're having a difficult time right now, I'm experiencing that too. But he's saying all this is true so that our joy would be complete. My joy increases as your joy increases. Now, that's another whole sermon, but we'll just stay with this idea right now. Let me try to illustrate this for you. How many of you uh, have kids or you are a kid and you play sports or you have some sort of thing you have to perform? maybe a piano recital, maybe it's a diving competition, maybe it's something like that, and you have to get up in front of people and do it. Now, as a parent, as a parent, when we're watching our own children have to perform, you're just, you're hanging on for dear life. Oh, man, I hope they remember. Oh, man, I hope they study. Oh, whatever. And, or I help them study. I help them prepare. I drove them to practice, whatever. And now it's all on. They're on the field. They're in the pool. They're on the stage. They have a test that week, whatever it would be. Now, what happens as a parent when they do well? You're ecstatic. You're ecstatic because they did it. They they performed well. And you vicariously as a parent, you're, you're, man, that was so awesome. We did it as a family. How many know when a kid gets into college, that is not the kid doing it. It is a family effort to get that kid into college. And when they do, they get an acceptance letter. You're like, we did it. Now, I know their name's on it. Dear so-and-so, you've been accept- we're proud to accept you into this institution. But you're like, they accepted us into this institution. We made it. We got them here. It's this idea of their joy completing your joy as you get through it. Now, it goes, we can get sinful and all that and live vicariously through our children and all the things we wanted that we want them to do and all that w- grossness. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the pure elation of a parent when your child breaks through in an area or accomplishes something that they've been striving for. Your joy is just overwhelming for them. I knew you could do it. I knew it. I knew you had it in you. And now I see it. And here we go. That's a little bit of what John is talking about here when we talk about the body of Christ, when we're growing together. Like when you get this, I get this. When you're walking in the fullness of joy and you're walking in Jesus, I'm walking with you in that. We're celebrating together. They rejoice 
you rejoice. So I will put it up on the screen. John's joy grows when the joy of his brothers and sisters grow. So the conclusion is we're all in this together. Individualistic Christianity just doesn't exist in the gospels or in the word of God. It's a community of faith doing it together. And so we experience this joy together, this connection between Christian hearts, not growing individually, although that is true, but we benefit one another. So this idea of private faith, yes, I have my own faith, but my faith affects my wife and my kids and this congregation and all of you. Now, he also says this, he says, he calls it joy complete or complete joy. We, we say all of these things so that your joy would be complete or we would have complete joy. What is he talking about? Complete joy. Now, what you could do, and some, some interpreters do, not interpreters, commentaries do this, where they talk about complete joy being impossible here and that one day we will have complete joy when Jesus comes back and we're with him. Then our joy will be fulfilled. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears. But this idea of complete joy is deferred talking about the future. Now, the end of time, that is true. We will have complete joy when Jesus returns and sets all of this brokenness right. All the horrible stuff in the world will be eradicated in a second, and we await that day. Even so now, Jesus, come quickly. But he talks about joy complete in the moment. I don't think it's deferred. He's talking about something that can be possible right now, that's profound and that can't be stopped, that it's possible in this life, there's a fullness of joy that's there because it's deeper than what's just on the surface. Now, when we had a house in Elk Harbor, our house was built on a hill and it had a retaining wall out in front of it. And behind us was another house that was more elevated. And then it kind of went on the hill from there. And what we didn't know when we bought the house, that there were these water tables underneath uh, the ground with the sediment layers and the hard pan and all of that. There was a flow of water that went under the ground right into our crawl space. And we didn't know that. But when it rained in the wintertime, we found out. And our crawl space begins to fill up with water. And so what do you do? You put a sump pump down there, right? So we put a sump pump down there and we had good friends in the church who would come fix it and work on it. And they were so faithful because I'm horrible in those environments. But they, they, he got under the ground, Dave Harden did. He got under the ground, he put a sump pump in. And then all winter long, what we would hear is the sump pump turning on. We'd be sitting in our, our, our sitting room, whatever, and we'd go, Burr, and we'd come on and we would know it's pumping out water. And then it would shut off. And this, all winter long, this would happen. And you know, winters here, it's about seven months, right? Eight months of rain. People right now, I love the Northwest. Well, okay, that's great. Come back in February. We'll, we'll see you then. But the sump pump would come on. But the, but the other effect that it had is this water seeped into our front yard. And so in the wintertime, our front yard would be spongy, you know, because of the moss and stuff. Anybody able to get rid of moss, by the way? Do you have a moss cure? Is there a moss cure? It, what? Dethatching your lawn. I've dethatched before. The moss just comes back with a vengeance. Okay, whatever. There is no cure. At some point, the rainforest is going to win, and it's just all going to be moss, right? Might as well just plant moss. We had a neighbor who planted moss in their front yard. That's what they did. That was their victory over moss. They just grew moss. Anyway, our front yard would be all spongy, but in the summertime, what would happen? The front yard would stay green, for the longest time, the backyard was like a barren wasteland that I never had to mow, but the front yard, I'd keep mowing it because it kept growing. Why? Because the water was seeping out from underneath the front of our yard, underneath the house, to the front of the yard. And it was stopped there by the retaining wall, and so it would just keep this water underneath, this subterranean flow of water, and the grass would stay green. What's my point? What is your point, Russ? My point is, is that it's possible to have a joy that's subterranean, that's underneath, that even when the drought comes, there's something there. There's something you can get down to, that you can draw from, even when there's no rain, even when life isn't going great. We're going to mention two factors to this joy in just a second, but I want to unpack it just for a minute. Joy grows out of fellowship with God. 
There's nothing wrong with other kinds of joy. We experience joy in life. You know, there's rain and there's sun in life. We love the sunny days. Some of us love the rainy days. But we experience different joys. Those are great things. But that, this joy we're talking about is different. This is the joy that we read about in Psalm 1. This is the joy we read about in Jeremiah 17. That for a follower of Jesus Christ, for a godly person, even when the drought comes, even when the heat comes, because our roots go deep, the water underneath is available even when there's no water coming down. Did you hear that? The water underneath is available even when there's no water coming down because our roots go deep into this source of water. Now, we might mistake this type of joy as just a mindset. I'm all for mindsets. I'm all for, um, you know, changing your mind and your thinking. Those are good things. But we're not talking about a mindset change per se. If, if we just engage in a mindset change, what can happen is we just choose to be joyful no matter what the circumstance. So I broke my leg, but I'm joyful about it. My father just died. Praise God, I'm joyful about, you know, that kind of like, maybe you know some people like that, and you're kind of like, you're a little bit, that's kind of weird. That's not the joy we're talking about. We're, I'm going to tell myself to act as if everything is okay all the time. Things are not okay all the time. How many of you can say amen to that? Like our world is broken. Our legs get broken. Our bodies get broken. Our relationships get broken. Our finances get broken. We, we, what this means is that we feel those circumstances. We feel the situations when they're broken around us. Jesus, at the tomb of Lazarus, wept. Did he weep because he was a weak human being? No, he wept because he was a perfect human being. It's perfect, it's right, it's godly, it's holy to weep and to grieve in the face of death and brokenness. It's perfectly godly to do that. Jesus did that. In fact, Tim Keller said this, that Jesus is the most discouraged person who never got depressed you will ever see. The most discouraged person who never got depressed that you will ever see. Now, can we use the word discouraged to describe Jesus? What else would you say about the Garden of Gethsemane? Where he's in the garden, he's like, I'm out of strength. I have nothing left. I'm beaten down. That's discouragement, but it's not depression. It's not giving up. It's an honesty about his humanness. Fully God, fully man, experiencing these emotions. Like, I got nothing left. I'm beat down. This situation is terrible. Lazarus is dead, weeping at death and what it's doing to his sisters. And, and yet, he wept but there was always a river underneath. Always a river underneath the tears. The tears were real. His discouragement was real, but there was always a source of water to tap into under the ground. John, the writer here, at the end of the book, he says this, he says, I write these things so that you may know that you are of God and that the whole world lieth in wickedness, he says. Verse, uh, chapter 5. The whole world lieth in wickedness. There's lots of different translations to that, but one of them says the whole world lies in the evil one. What John is saying here is we know this world is a terrible place. We know the world is broken. We know there are tremendous evil forces out there in the world all around us. We're not denying that. This joy is not, and I put it on the screen, it's not whistling past the graveyard, pretending that everything is okay. That's not what this joy is. John goes on to say that, well, when he references who he's writing to over and over again, he calls them my children. He calls us my children. Now, John was probably about 80 or 90 when he wrote this. 80 or 90 years old. Now, 
by the time you're 80 or 90 in life, I'm not there yet, I'm close, but I'm not there yet. But by the time you're 80 or 90, you've seen a lot of life. You've had a lot of experiences. You've experienced a lot of good things and quite a few bad things. And you see a lot of 80 and 90 year olds who are quite cynical about life, about the world around them. They're cynical. Uh, many times bitterness creeps in at those ages because they're just, they've just handled so much in life. But John is not this way. John keeps referencing this, this loving affection for his people, my children. My children, let me teach you these things. My children, let me talk to you about joy. Now, what is holding him up? What holds those of you in the room who are in that age bracket, who are joyful people, what holds you up? What's keeping you from being in absolute despair given the state of the world? You can't despair. You won't despair. It's not something you're trying to avoid or trying to do. There's something keeping you up. There's a river underneath. There's a river underneath. And it's possible to have that joy. It's possible, John is saying, to tap into that river all the time. On the other hand, this joy is stubborn. It can be stubborn. Now, that's okay. Stubborn joy is a good thing. Knowing there's a condition or no condition that can take this away from you. Nothing can take it away from you. The whole world lieth with the evil one, but nothing is going to take this joy away from me because my joy is not dictated by the circumstances around me. Circumstances change. Some days it rains. Some days you're feeling good. Some day you open your mailbox and there's a check in there that you didn't expect. Good days and other days there's no rain, but your joy doesn't change. However, I will say this. Do you know that sometimes the best thing that the Lord can do for us is to have our circumstances go south do you know that as a follower of Jesus? Sometimes the best thing that God can do for us is to have our circumstances get difficult. Now, why would he allow that? Why would he allow that? Well, some of us don't realize where we're getting our delight from. What makes our day? Money in the bank makes our day. My kids doing well makes our day. My marriage going great makes our day. My boss loves me, makes our day. And sometimes God will allow situations to change in our life so that it exposes this false delight that we have. And what it does is it forces us to dig down deep in those moments, to recognize that, man, this is where my delight was, and this is no longer a source of delight, or it has changed on me. My body has changed on me. I got to dig down. Where's the water? It's underneath. Some of you may be feeling like, man, I'm, I'm so dry right now. I'm dying of thirst. I feel so parched. I got nothing. And maybe circumstances in your life have changed to the point where you got to be like, I'm digging in the wrong place. I'm digging in the wrong place. Where's your joy coming from? And lastly, the last thought before we get into the final two sources of this joy is that joy is a byproduct of something else. Now, if you're listening to me, what you might immediately go to is, how do I get it? I want this joy. How do I seek this joy out? Well, here's the trick about this joy, this complete joy. You can't seek it for itself. It's a byproduct of something else. Now, I'm not just playing a trick on you. Danielle preached on this a little bit ago about the Beatitudes, but Jesus said this, blessed are those who what? Seek blessedness. Happy are those who seek happiness. It doesn't say that. He says, blessed are those who are poor. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Blessed are the meek. He's saying that the blessedness this joy, this internal joy, this joy complete that comes from down deep isn't from seeking the joy itself. It's from seeking these other things. 
What have you been seeking? What have you been hungering and thirsting after? You'll never find joy if you seek after it directly. It's found somewhere else. So how do I get it? Here are the two factors. You already know these already, but I'm going to reiterate them for you this morning. Factor number one, know God. You got to know God. I already knew that, Russ. Okay. Why is John telling us all these things? Well, here's what he's trying to tell us over and over again. He says, the life appeared and we've seen it and testified to it. We proclaim it to you. What life is he talking about? He's talking about the life of Jesus. He's proclaiming the gospel to us. We proclaim it to you as we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us whose fellowship is with the Father and the Son. The reason we're writing to you this, that your joy may be fulfilled is your joy comes out of a particular type of fellowship and it's fellowship with God. That's where it comes from. Now, how many of you talk to Siri on a daily or weekly basis, have a conversation with Siri? How many of you talk to Alexa instead? You'd rather talk to Alexa. Great. How many of you talk to your cars? Like really, like you'll tell your car to do something and it will do something car play blah 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 and a song will come on magically now it just comes on car call so and so and then so and so is now talking to you in your car because we have a conversation with our car we have a conversation with siri we have conversations with alexa our world is completely interactive at this point or for the most part interactive but a lot of us hasn't gotten to the place where we're interactive in our prayer life or with jesus Many of us have more conversations with Alexa or Siri than we do with Jesus. Is Jesus present in your life? Is he a part of you? <laughs> this is a goofy illustration, but I'm going to use it. I'm just, uh, it's honesty. How many of you get stuck in a track of thinking where you just think you're right? And then all of a sudden there's, Jason, you do? You're the only one. Me and you, brother. But then all of a sudden there's this arresting moment where you realize, wow, I was wrong. Now, feeling wrong and feeling right feel exactly the same. They feel exactly the same until the truth comes out. And then you realize you're either wrong or you're right. Then you might feel a little differently after that. But in the moment when you're wrong and you're right, you feel exactly the same. Like, I'm right. Even if you're wrong, you feel right. They feel, when Wiley Coyote goes off the cliff chasing the roadrunner, right, he feels great. And then he's 40 feet off the cliff, and he still feels good. He's right until he looks down. And then he realizes there's 2,000 feet of just air between him. And of course, he survives because Wiley Coyote is indestructible but he hits the ground and he's fine, right? And then they just, he has maybe a bandage on his arm and then he goes after the road runner again later. My point is, we all get out there off that cliff sometimes and we're like, I'm totally right. And then you realize I'm 2,000 feet. <laughs> just me and 2,000 feet of air before I hit the ground. Now, I had been in a particular train of thought uh, in my marriage and like, I am right and justified in this way of thinking. I'm right. I have my own justifications. I have my own theories about all that's wrong with Anna, and I've just calculated it. I've countered her arguments in my head, like her counter argument. I've got that one. By the way, I never, ever win an argument with my wife, ever, 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 ever. That's why she's going to law school, and I am not. But we watched Pride and Prejudice yesterday, and I don't know if you've seen that movie or read the book. But when you get to the end and Mr. Darcy comes after Lizzie and then it gets exposed, like all that Mr. Darcy has done to win Lizzie, you know, saved their other sister's marriage by getting her married off and then bringing his buddy back to court the other sister and all these things that Mr. Darcy did behind the scenes that, that Lizzie never knew about and she had misjudged him. And then all of a sudden it's revealed 
Mr. Darcy has done all these things. Oh, and he's a gazillionaire on top of that. And there's this moment, right? And I'm bawling my eyes out because I'm just like, oh, I'm so far from Mr. Darcy. It was pathetic. I just cried and cried, asked Anna to come upstairs, and I was just like, I am so wrong. I'm so wrong. And we went on to have another much deeper conversation that was me just repenting, basically. But it, it was interesting that God used that moment to just shine a light on my own heart and be like, you want to know what love looks like? This is a, well, I mean, a stylized version of love, but this is what love is. It's self-sacrificial. It's caring for the other person above yourself. It's getting your own self out of the way. It's like, you need to die, Russ. Your ideas need to just go away. And I wept because, not just because it's a great movie, I'd seen it before. And I didn't cry when I'd seen it before. I wept because I knew it was the Lord was speaking to me through this, sil not silly, I'm sorry, through this movie. I'm just like, man, all that to say this, like, is there interaction with Jesus? Is your heart open to Jesus? Mine sometimes is not. It's closed because I think I'm right when I'm wrong. Is God teaching you things? Is he restraining you from things? Is he counseling you? Is he supporting you? Is he showing you things? Do you have a sense that there's an ongoing interaction between you and the Lord where your heart is pliable to him? Or is your religion flat and one-dimensional? Let me put it this way. Is there a personal dealing between you and God? Do you sense things happen, happening to you? Is there anything indicating to you that there's personal interactivity between you and the Lord? That's the first one for subterranean joy. No God. Number two, and this war will close. Know that you know God. Know that you know God. Let's put number two up on the screen, guys. There it is. Know that you know God. What do I mean? In chapter 2 of 1 John, verse 3, this is how we know we are in him, he says. And then he goes on, verses 12 through 14. Let me just read them to you, 12 through 14, and see if you can spot how we know that we know him. I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God lives in you. You have overcome the evil one. What is he saying? I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. His name. On the one hand, do you know God and is there fellowship with him? On the other hand, are you sure that it's not an illusion that he absolutely loves you and completely accepts you and that you are well-pleasing in his sight? Not because of your works, but because of what Jesus Christ has done on account of his name. Because of what Jesus did. And because of what Jesus did, you're pleasing to him. He accepts you and he loves you. You're safe in him. Or if somebody asked you if you were a Christian, you would say, well, I'm trying. I don't really know for sure. I guess I'll find out when I die. Do you know, I think it's safe to say this. Every other religion in the world is based on how you live. And then you find out at the end if you were good enough or not, or if you did the right things enough, then you get in. That's not Christianity. What Christianity says, it's not based on how you live. It's based on how he lived for you. Let me say that again. 
It's not based on how you live. It's based on how he lived for you. Jesus took that perfect life and died on the cross and took all of your sin, all of your brokenness, all of your failings with him. And if you say it is by Jesus name alone that I am saved, he paid the price for me and he alone makes me worthy. Then you are a Christian and you are secure in his arms. You're safe with him. Let me give you a practical example. If somebody asked you how to handle anxiety. Now, if you read a book on anxiety, it would probably tell you a couple things to do. First, remind yourself that anxiety is debilitating, that it's actually doing harm. And if you're really anxious before the test you have to take, by, by carrying that anxiety in there, you'll underperform on the test. So just understand how damaging anxiety is. And number two, the book might tell you that you just need some simple practices. Think about something else. Be mindful of other things that bring you joy or other things that bring you happiness and step out of your anxiety. Are you using a technique in that moment? How many of you have experienced anxiety before? I have. The last time I really experienced it, I was in Israel and I was under Herod's wall. And under Herod's wall, you go down into these like caverns and catacombs. And then you end up in the, I ended up in this section where it was just carved out. It was just stone like this and a low stone ceiling. And we're probably 30 feet underground at that point. And I end up in the back of this little cavern and there's probably a hundred people between me and the entrance. And it's not a big space. It's like that, this way, just packed with people. And I'm all the way in the back. And all of a sudden I realized I can't get out of here. I can't get out. And I thought, where's the nearest exit? And it's like hundreds of feet this way to go up these steps and hundreds of feet this way to go up these steps. I mean, this wall is enormous. And I'm, I think, I can't get out. I can't get out. I can't get out. And I just start panicking. Just start panicking that I can't get out. This full-on claustrophobia takes over me. Or you're getting on an airplane and you start to think about the airplane. You think, well, I know some people who work for Boeing. And they riveted this thing together. I don't know if I'm that excited to get on this aircraft right now. I mean, people, I'm not just dogging people who work for, I mean, it's a plane. But then some of us get on planes and we start to think, man, this thing might go down. I can't get out. All the exits are shut. I'm 10,000 feet in the air. I'm 20,000 feet in the air now. I can't get out of here. And you start to panic. Now, what would be good in that situation? Well, you could do the anxiety exercise. You could say, well, anxiety is damaging me right now. It's not good for me. Or I'll use some techniques. I'll think about a happy place. I'm in a pool, swimming, open water, it's beautiful. Or, or what you could do is dig down deep in that moment. Get to the water that's there. You could say, I know the creator of the universe, the one who invented life, the word of life, the one who was there at the beginning, who was willing to die for me. He was willing to be turned into body parts for me. Now, if that's true, then I know that even though bad things can happen here, they can happen on this plane, they can happen under Herod's wall, I have the one who really counts, who is working all these things out for good in my life. He's overruling all these things. Everything that's going on is going on out of his loving purpose. Someday he's going to come back and he's going to put all this brokenness to rest and he's going to heal all of it. But right now, he's with me in this moment. And because he is with me in this moment, I don't need anything else. I have him. So I don't know what your situation is in life right now. I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know if your relationships are going great, if you've got issues at school, if there's money stuff. But for joy that's unfallible, we can't be blown to and fro by our circumstances. For joy that's unfallible, what John is telling us is it comes from relationship with God and then knowing that because of what Jesus did, we're secure in him and he's with us in every situation. Let's pray together.
I'm just going to pray, and I'm going to pray for you and with you. If you're here in the room, I want to pray with you. If you feel far from God this morning or you feel like you've never known this water, you've never known a land that has that water in it, that that joy is even possible. It's because you've never known Jesus. Your circumstances dictate your life and how it goes. You control your life. And perhaps today Jesus is asking you to yield that control and give it to him. So I want to pray for you first. If that's you. You can just pray with me right now. Jesus, I come to you this morning, and I admit that I've run my life. I admit that I've been in control. And I admit I own the fact that the land I'm in right now is dry. There's no water. So I come before you, Jesus, right now, and I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge that you, when you went to the cross, that was you dying for me. All my sin, all my brokenness. And I ask you to forgive me. And now, Jesus, I ask you to come into my life as my Lord and my Savior and to take over my life. To be in control from this day forward. Teach me your ways. Teach me how to dig Teach me the source of living water, joy that is subterranean. Now, for the other folks in the room who are already followers of Jesus Christ, I want to pray with you this morning. Think of that issue right now or issues that cause you anxiety, cause you to worry. It might be as simple as enclosed spaces. It might be something that's with you all the time. Father in heaven, we come before you this morning and we acknowledge there are good mental exercises to use. We're not sliding those. But there's only one you, God. There's only one creator of the universe. There's only one who sent his son to the earth to become a man, to feel all these emotions, to feel discouraged, to, to cry. And yet in the midst of all of that, no, there was a source underneath. There was a river that he was always tapped into. God, I don't want this anxiety anymore. I don't want this fear anymore. I don't want this worry anymore. If there's issues, yeah, I see them. They're real. And sometimes they're discouragement in me. But God, I declare you today to be my source of life. I declare you to be the only one that I need Renew my fellowship with you, that I would walk with you every day, talk to you more than I talk to Siri and Alexa. And that I would know, 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 know that my faith and my salvation is you doesn't hinge on my own brokenness or not. It hinges on the cross of Jesus Christ. Because you have died for me, Jesus, I'm secure in you. You love me care for me, you walk with me, and you're with me now in the midst of this moment. So God, I pray for joy for your people. I pray for peace for your people in the midst of circumstances. I pray that it's overwhelming, a contentment, no matter what is going on, that God is going to work this to good for me. We proclaim this to ourselves because it is true and it is good. In the name of Jesus, we pray this morning. Amen. 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 Well, let me remind you guys a couple of things, of a couple of things. One, to be praying for our students as they head off to camp again this week. We've got middle school camp coming up that starts tomorrow. Kids camp was amazing. The testimony is coming out of that, and you'll hear some more in the coming weeks. Amazing test. Just God was, he just moved. And then middle school this week and then high school next week. You have a list of those names in your bulletin. Please pray for the names of the students and leaders. And then lastly, what I want to say is that the prayer team will be up here if you'd like some additional prayer this morning. And if you do see people praying up here, if you could just move your conversations to the lobby, that would be awesome. Let's stand together, guys. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. 
We thank you for a man like John who was able to write in the midst of a situation that was utterly chaotic and bring truth to us. Go with us now as we head out into this world around us that is still, as your word said, under control of the evil one, but your kingdom is here in us and moving in the world. Use us this week to be light in the darkness and bring us back soon to a house that glorifies your name. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Have a great Sunday, guys. Love you. We'll see you soon.